From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Mrs. Henderson. You asked me to call, Mr. Dollar? Yes, Mrs. Henderson. I'm with Paramount Insurance Adjusters. Oh, yes. You probably know we asked for the inquest into your husband's death. Yes, I know. We're trying to clear up the entire matter as quickly as we can, Mrs. Henderson. I'd like to talk to you. Oh? Hate to trouble you at a time like this. Well, that's all right, Mr. Dollar. When do you want to talk? May I come out to the house this afternoon? There's a nice restaurant called Big Horn Lodge on the highway. How about meeting you there at, say, uh, 4 o'clock? Good. I'll be there. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. Expense account continued. Item seven, five bucks. One pair of galoshes, believe it or not. It snowed in Culver, Montana during the night, all night. By morning, 14 inches of fine new snow covered everything in sight. After my phone call to Mrs. Henderson, I spent the morning trying to rent an automobile. There was none to be had, so that afternoon I dropped over to see Eve Holton, my sheriff friend. Son, you're going to catch your death unless you start wearing a scarf. Yeah, I'll remember that, Eve. But maybe I won't need one. Oh? Yeah, I think I'll be leaving Culver pretty soon. Well, I hope you don't mean that, son. I'm afraid I do. I'll have to tie this case up one way or another pretty quick. Why? My company wants me to get back home. I got a letter this morning. Oh, well, how can I help you? Well, for one thing, you can lend me your car again. I, uh, I have a date with a lady out at the Bighorn Lodge. <laughs> pretty fancy. You can have the old thing anytime you want it. You know that, son. Who's the lady? George Henderson's widow. Yeah. Oh. Now, I know what you're going to say. Why go after her? Why bother her until I have something to go on? Well, I got to do something, Eve. I'm no nearer now to knowing whether Henderson was pushed out that hotel window, fell, or jumped. I think I have enough of an idea of Henderson and his wife to pick up some valuable information from her. Any objections? Nope. Johnny... A couple of days ago, you asked me to look up people who might have been especially friendly to Mrs. Henderson. You still want to know about them? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm working on it. Anyone so far? Nobody I'd put in that category. What time you have to be at the Bighorn? Four. It'll take you a while. Wouldn't hurt to start right now. He's, uh, she's parked out back. Okay, thanks, Eve. Good luck. And don't let her rangdangle you, son. She could do it if she wanted to. Goodbye, Eve. Ten minutes later, I was on the road to Bighorn Lodge, which also happened to be the same road I'd traveled two days before to attend George Henderson's funeral. As I drove past the graveyard, white and stark against the blue winter sky, I noticed a car parked along the side of the road, a little Chevy Coupe, about 1952. There was the figure of a woman, all alone, standing by George Henderson's fresh grave. Her head was bowed. She didn't notice me as I walked up. A gray-haired woman, about 45, slight, delicate, gentle. <gasps> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to start it. Oh, that's all right. Must be getting late. Dear, it is. Uh, do I know you? Why, I don't know. I'm Maddie Knickerbocker. The name had startled me. The day before, an insurance broker in Great Falls had mentioned her, told me that George Henderson had named her his beneficiary, then changed his mind a few minutes before he died. Your name's not Campbell, is it? No. Johnny Dollar. Oh, Johnny Dollar. You remind me of a boy I had in one of my classes once, Tory Campbell. Oh, you're a teacher, Miss Knickerbocker? <laughs> yes, yes. Everybody knows me, I think. Or at least I flatter myself that way. <laughs> well, I should be going. I, uh... I knew Mr. Henderson, too. Oh? He was a wonderful man, George. He was very dear to me. I'll find it difficult getting used to the fact that he'll never be around anymore. George had a wonderful laugh, didn't he? Yes. Yes, he did, Mrs. Knickerbocker. I never really thought that he ever grew up. 
Of course, you knew him in a business way, and I'm sure he was very, very grown up in business. But it doesn't hurt to think of him this way now, does it? I don't think so, Miss Knickerbocker. I didn't come to his funeral. I didn't think I could bear it. I thought I'd just drive out this afternoon and say goodbye by myself. Well, I apologize for interrupting you. Not at all, please. <laughs> Funny little things. Hmm? The birds in the snow. Oh. Such tiny, wonderful little things. A little bit of God in each of them, Mr. Dollar, wouldn't you say? Yes, ma'am. I don't know why. I think George would like to know they're here, near him. Miss Knickerbocker, I have to tell you... No, that... you don't, Mr. Dollar. I know who you really are. Everyone in town knows. You seem like a nice young man. Was it curiosity that made you stop your car? Yeah, I suppose so. I apologize. Oh, you needn't. I'm just an old friend of George's saying goodbye to him. Good afternoon, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye. Talking to Maddie Knickerbocker, I felt that for the first time, somebody, namely Maddie, had talked frankly and truthfully about George Henderson. I was still thinking of the frail, drab little woman with the nice blue eyes when I met Pauline Henderson at the Bighorn Lodge. What are these matters you want to clear up, Mr. Dollar? Oh, just some doubts in my mind about your husband's death. What do you drink? Perno. Perno. I learned to like it in France. All right. Uh, one Perno, bourbon, a little water on the side. Yes, sir. You sound like George when you order. Hey, I like your Bighorn Lodge. And I have to say, when it's elegant in the West, it's elegant. I'd like a light, please. Oh, sorry. Sure. Thank you. Mrs. Henderson, do you mind if I don't stall any longer with the drinks, the smokes, and the compliments? I'm surprised you've stalled this long. I've heard you're a very blunt and impulsive man. I spoke to an insurance agent named Thurber yesterday in Great Falls. Your husband's agent. Mr. Thurber told me that your husband wanted to name a new beneficiary last week. Really? Yeah. He named Matilda Knickerbocker. Matty Knickerbocker. I'm not surprised, I suppose. Matty's a lovely woman. I know George was very fond of Mr. her. Mr. Thurber also told me that Mr. Henderson changed his mind about that the day he died. In fact, he phoned Mr. Thurber in Great Falls and told him to leave the policy as it was. He did that a few minutes after you left his hotel room, a few minutes before he died. Can you explain any of that, Mrs. Henderson? Why don't you ask Mary Knickerbocker? Because I don't think she'd know. I ran into her this afternoon and I talked to her. Or not about this, just about other things. I'll look her up again if I have to. But it's you I want information from now. Then why don't you ask what you mean, Mr. Dollar? All right. Did something happen in that hotel room that made him change his mind about you? That's better. I do wish that ridiculous little man would bring our drinks. He will. Don't misunderstand what happened in the hotel room. George and I were going to be divorced. He moved out of the house a month ago. We went to his attorney's and drew up a tentative property settlement. You mean... Dunlap, Edder, Reardon, and Blake, Great Falls... They have a copy of that settlement. George was quite generous to me. So I didn't kill him for his money, if that's what you're thinking. Here we are, sir. Perno bourbon. Thank you. I didn't see George for mm, three weeks or so after we made the settlement. Then we happened to meet one day in Culver, and... Well, we had a rather bitter argument. It was one of those ridiculous things. We quarreled and parted very angrily. The whole thing was childish. My first impulse was to go right back to the lawyers and demand every unreasonable thing I could on the divorce settlement. I guess George's first impulse was to cancel me out as his beneficiary. Did you go to a lawyer, Mrs. Henderson? No. No, I cooled off. I cooled off considerably, Mr. Dollar. After all, George had been everything to me most of my life. I was truly sorry we never got along as man and wife. I'm glad that we made it up before he died. That morning... He apologized when I came by the hotel. I apologized. After I left, he fell out the window. 
Then I can assume that this business with the policies had to do with the argument. Assume what you like, Mr. Dollar. I can understand why you're annoyed by me and my questions. It's just that it's kind of hard for us to believe that a man involved in divorcing his wife would still name her as his beneficiary. I say that because of past experience. Oh, it's happened, but as usual. I could have told you that we were reconciled that day in the hotel, that we were going to drop the whole divorce matter, and that George was coming back to the house to live. Yes, you could have told me that, Mrs. Henderson. Mr. Connors in our home office in Hartford called you a few days ago. You hung up on him. Why? Well, I was very upset. I've never been a widow before. Uh Uh-huh. I believe you, Mrs. Henderson, sitting here like this. You're a lovely person, and I know it, and you know it. And this is a pretty nice place to conduct business. Why didn't you ask me to your home? I preferred to talk to you here. That's what I thought. I saved all the... Did your husband have any enemies? And did he seem depressed questions for another time? But before I went to bed that night, I read and reread Mrs. Henderson's testimony given at the coroner's inquest. The next morning, I interviewed all of the people at the Butte Hotel who'd been on duty the day Henderson fell out the window. After that, I dropped in to see Eve Holton. Here, here it is, Johnny, right here. Personal effects of the deceased included four suits of men's clothing, 14 shirts, five pairs of holders. Was there a bottle in that room, Sheriff? Liquor? Yeah. No, no bottle. Nothing like it, son. All right. He didn't call down and have a bellboy bring him a bottle or send him any drinks. The chambermaid swears there was no liquor in his room all the time he lived at the hotel. You say he was a light drinker. Now, what light drinker takes a nip before he has his breakfast? Who said he had a drink that morning? Mrs. Henderson. What? On the witness stand, under oath at the inquest. She testified that her husband had a drink before she came up to the room and while she was there. Now, mind you, she didn't say he was drunk, but she did say he had been drinking. You read over that transcript. So? So I think she threw that in, made sure it got in, because it's sometimes hard to believe that a cold, sober man will walk out of a hotel window and kill himself accidentally. A drunk or a drinker might do it. You and I and everybody at that inquest somehow got the impression that Henderson was slightly tipsy that morning. And Mrs. Henderson saw to that. Now then, if Henderson had a drink, I want to know where he got it. Tell me, Eve, no bottle in the room, no bottle brought up to the room. Where did he get that drink? That's a pretty good question, son. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Henderson matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the wind-up. Yeah, the whole case blows sky high. Join us, won't you? Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.